So we are ready for the lesson entitled How to See Good Days. If you want to follow along in your book, it begins on page 31. Um, we have a few of our ladies who are not able to be out with us, so you guys remember them in prayer. Um, anything else that we need to be remembering in prayer that y'all know of? Yep, just those folks. Alrighty, well let's bow our heads and begin. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. We thank you for this gorgeous, beautiful day that you have blessed us with. But God, we realize that we need some rain, so please give us some rain soon before things get too dried out. Thank you, God, for blessing us with all the different types of weather that you give us. Thank you, God, for blessing us with um, our friends and our family. Thank you, God, for blessing us with our needs that we have met day to day, uh, our food and our clothing and our shelter and, and all of those things. God, please help us to use all of our blessings to glorify you and to point people in your direction. Help us to use our health and our wealth and our time and, and um all of these blessings to bless other people's lives and to draw them closer to you and to teach them your way. Because we know, God, that your way is the best way for while we're here on this earth, but your way is also the way that leads us to eternity with you in heaven. We're so thankful for our Savior Jesus, who emptied himself and, and took on a human body, that he might... Uh, be the sacrificial lamb that would take away our sins and the sins of all people of all times that we might be able to live with you in heaven where there's neither crying nor evil nor tiredness but everything is perfect and good we want to be with you eternally God be with us that you would help us to be aware that we do not commit sins uh, that we do not think and say and do the wrong things, but also, God, help us to be aware that we don't leave undone the things that you would have us to do, those sins of omission, so that when our end of life is here, that we can stand in judgment and hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into thy kingdom of rest. And we thank you so, God, for the hope of heaven. And we ask all of this through the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, how to see good days. What does it mean to love life? Sometimes our definition and the Bible's definition and our definition and God's definition are different things. If, if I went out on the street and I asked people, what does it mean to love life and see good days? I would get all kinds of different responses. Um, but we're going to see what Scripture teaches about how to love life and see good days good days. In our, in our book, the author mentions that there are two words used in the New Testament for life that um, in our English translations have been translated in life. But in the uh, language that was written, that the Bible was written in, there are two words, bios, B-I-O-S, and it's translated life, and it means physical life. So it means this body that we that our soul inhabits and there is an example of that in Acts 17 and verse 28 so an example of where bios is used and translated life or living is Acts 17 and verse 28 which reads for in him we live and move and exist there's that word um, as even some of your own poets have said. So that existence, that physical life. The second um, word that is used in translated life is Z-O-E. In English, I guess we would say Zoe, like the name. I don't know if that's how it's supposed to be pronounced, but anyway. It means new life or spiritual life. 
So if you go to John 10, 10, there is an example of that. John 10 and verse 10, which reads, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is Jesus speaking, and we know that Jesus didn't come so that we can have this physical life, but so that we can have the spiritual life, the new life in him. And then in Genesis 2 and verse 7, um, it reads, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living thing. And this place... Um, the word Zoe is used because when God breathed into us, he had already made our physical bodies. He had already made the physical body of Adam, but he breathed into him the spiritual, the soul, the inner, the inner man. So those are the two different kinds. Um, and our author says this spiritual life, this inner man, can either be stunted or strengthened as grace is used or abused. And sometimes we don't understand what the word grace means, but grace means undeserved favor. Let me ask you a question. Does God give grace to all mankind? Yes, <coughs> in one way or the other. Yes, ma'am, he does. Unmerited favor, okay? And so to say that grace can be used or abused is to say that the blessings that God blesses us with, the grace that he gives to us, we can either use it to draw closer to him and we can use it for good or we can abuse those blessings, draw away from him and use them in evil ways. And so in order to understand this a little bit better, we're going to turn to the book of Romans and we're going to look at chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. I think I need to take a drink of water. First off, we're going to begin with verse 1 through verse 5. So here we read Romans 9, 1 through 5. I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the temple service, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. So here Paul is speaking, he's writing this letter, and he has great sorrow over the Jewish nation, who are his brethren, who had denied Christ and who had fought against Christ the whole time Christ was on the earth. And he said of all the people on the earth that were most blessed, most abundantly given this grace, it was the Jewish nation. So look at verse 4. They, uh, it says, who are Israelites to whom belongs the adoption as sons. Who was the tribe or who was the people? Who were the people that were that were God's people, the chosen people in the Old Testament, the Israelites, the Jewish nation. Um, they were given the glory and the covenants, the agreements with God. Remember, God spoke to Abraham and made this agreement that he would bless the earth through Abraham and that Abraham would see um, um, uh, sons and daughters innumerable, etc. And the giving of the law. Who did God give the Ten Commandments and all the law to? He gave it to the Israelite nation. And the temple service and the promises. And then verse 5, they are the fathers. Who, who, who were, you know, Moses, Abraham, all these great men, David. They were the fathers of the Jewish nation that they looked back to and they could follow their example. They're great leaders and uh, from whom the Christ came. Who did uh, Jesus come through? He came through their lineage. 
That's why God preserved them in the Old Testament so that they could be the lineage through whom Jesus was born as a human being. And so they had all these blessings. They had all of these promises. They had all of this grace. And yet, they rejected God. So they didn't use that grace um, in a good way. They, uh, uh, they just took it for granted. They abused it, okay? And then go on and let's look at verse 15 through verse 21. Let me change my page here. Okay. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. For you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, Why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? So if we look at these verses, on the surface it looks like God made Pharaoh and made him harden his heart and made him be abusive to the Israelites and made him be rebellious. But that's not what this is saying. This is saying that God gives each of us traits and personalities, okay? And we can either use those traits and personalities for good, or we can use them for bad. For example, some of us are more stubborn than others. Some of us are bigger talkers. We're more gregarious. We're more outgoing. Some of us are shyer. Some of us prefer to spend time, alone time, while others like to just be out and about with everybody. Some of us can concentrate for many hours on one certain thing, and we're, we're good with that. And others of us split from here to here to here to here to here, you know. Um, some of us um, smile a lot. We have a gentleman who is one of our patients, and even looking at his uh, license the other day, his license picture, he has this little grin. And he can it just, he's grinning all the time and others of us don't grin all the time it doesn't mean we're sad it just means that's just not our personality that's not what we do and we can use all of this for good or for bad you can use that stubbornness in a good way to persevere and to to keep on keeping on as a christian to keep on going back to people and trying to encourage them to become christians where some of the rest of us would give up quicker you can use that that a very uh, outgoing personality to speak to people and try to get Bible studies and encourage them and, um, and teach them. Or if you're quiet, you can use that a long time to write cards. It seems like I do much better writing my thoughts out and sending them to you in a card than I do coming up to you and speaking them to you because I'm more of an introvert. Um, so whatever is in your personality, it's grace that gave it to you, and it's God that gave it to you, but you use it in a good way. Um, Pharaoh didn't use his in a good way. He hardened his heart. Matter of fact, in the book of Exodus, we see in one point where he says, I have sinned against God and I have sinned against you. So God didn't make Pharaoh rebel. God didn't make Pharaoh um, ugly toward the Israelite nation and, and didn't make Pharaoh reject him, but Pharaoh used that, that personality that God gave him in the negative way. So is that clear for everybody? No, not really. Okay. I'm, I mean, because I just, I just don't see that. Because if God had not, if, if Pharaoh's heart was not hardened, things wouldn't have worked out. 
like it did. But when you have a blanket statement that says it does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy, because we all sin, and if we don't have God's mercy, we have no hope. Well, and God didn't make Pharaoh harden his heart. God knew that Pharaoh would harden his heart because God knows the future. But God didn't make it. God does not make any of us puppets. He does not make any of us puppets. And does it say in Scripture, for God so loved the world, loves everybody, wants everybody. In, in Peter, it says that God hasn't brought an end to this world because he's waiting for more people to be saved. He wants everybody to be saved. He wanted Pharaoh to be saved, but he knew that Pharaoh would not obey. He knew that Pharaoh would rebel, but he didn't make Pharaoh rebel. Matter of fact, it says in one, in one part, in, well, verse 18 here, he has, all, he has mercy. And verse, um, there's another verse, which I read this morning, um, and I don't know where it is, but it says that he was patient. Mm -hmm. He was patient with Pharaoh. Well, yes, ma'am. If God gives us free will, and he hardens Pharaoh's heart, then that's taking the Pharaoh's free he will He didn't away. harden Pharaoh's that's heart. That's what I'm saying. He allowed. If, if, he, if he does. Yes. Yes. Harden his heart, then that's taking that's his correct. will away. That's correct. So he, he didn't harden his he heart. Used, he, used, <coughs> he used Pharaoh to get his will done. Right. And it looks like he uses us. I mean, and just like he used other evil people in the Old Testament. Remember when he wanted his nation punished? He allowed the Assyrians to come in and punish them and take them captive. He allowed the Babylonians to come in. But did he send them in? He just let them come in. He let them he come in. He didn't stop them from coming in. Right, right, right. God allows people free will, but he uses that free will to his purposes. Because, because it's hard for us to understand, but he sees the whole picture. We don't see the whole picture. He sees the future. He knows what we're going to say, what we're going to think, what we're going to do before we ever say, think, or do it. Not because we're puppets and he makes us do that, but he just knows it because he has all knowledge. He saw that tendency in Pharaoh probably that he would harden his Right, heart. right. And he used him for something good out of it. Yeah, right. And that's the reason why we're given some up. Not each of us has the same amount of grace or mercy. I mean, because some of us are bad, worse than others. Well, that's right. We all have grace and mercy just by being human beings <coughs> on this earth. You know, the scripture says God causes the sun to rise and he causes rain to fall, whether you're faithful or unfaithful. But he does offer special promises to his faithful Um just like in, in, in the Old Testament, he promised the children of Israel, if you're faithful to me, I will defeat, I will let you defeat all of your enemies. You know, I will fight your battles for you. Well, he didn't say that to all the other nations. He said that to them because if they were faithful, any time a person is faithful to God, they are promised special blessings. We're all recipients of God's grace, but how we use it is up to us. Results come from it. That is so true. Good discussion going on here. Good discussion. So, um, God loves everyone and wants everyone's life to be full of good days. Um, and we mentioned John 3.16, for God so loved the world. But look with me at Proverbs 19 and 23. Proverbs 19 and 23. Which reads, the fear of the Lord leads to life, so that one may sleep satisfied, untouched by evil. So God wants us to be able to have that restful, peaceful sleep. He wants us to have the good life, and it begins with fearing the Lord, honoring Him, and following His ways. So, if we'll go to 1 Peter 3... 
we will see where our lesson text comes from. 1 Peter 3, verse 10 and verse 11. These um, are verses that Peter quoted from the Old Testament. If you look in Psalm 34, you will see these verses. Um, but we're going to read from 1 Peter 3, 10 and 11. For the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. So this is the basis of our lesson today, choosing to love life. Um, first, it says, the one who desires life to love and see good days, it is a choice. First of all, it is a choice. You don't just live life willy-nilly, helter-skelter. You have to have a plan. You make a choice. You choose to live uh, in, in uh, obedience to God or you choose not to live in obedience to God. You choose to be a nurse or you choose to be a secretary. You choose to be... Uh, to get up at 6 o'clock or you choose 8 o'clock. I mean... We make lots of choices in life. We don't, we shouldn't live life willy-nilly, helter-skelter. We should have some structure into our life. And structure is based on our choices. And so let's live our lives as Christians with purpose and choose, choose well. So we choose, we make a conscious decision. Choosing is a verb. It's not a noun. It implies we're doing something, okay? So we choose first, we decide first that we want to live a good life and we want to see good days and the way we do this is we follow God's will. Okay, so we choose whether we're going to have a good life. We choose whether we're going to have a bad life. We're all making choices. And so the point I want to get from that is we're all doing something. Now look previously in 1 Peter um, because Peter gets real down to earth and he teaches about conduct and conduct of life, practical living. For example, in chapter 2 around verse 18, he talks about servants being submissive and being submissive even to, to their masters who are not good masters, okay? And then in uh, chapter 3, for example, it talks about the wives being submissive to their husbands, even if the husbands um, are disobedient to the Word of God, the, you know, even if they're not Christians. So Peter is getting really practical here, and he's telling Christians that you're going to have to choose these ways of living that are counter to what culture is telling you or that are counter to what your own wisdom might tell you. For example, um, uh, a slave who had a master who was mean and hateful might think the best way to, to deal with that is to rebel. Or a wife who had a husband who was disobedient to God might think the best way to live her life is to make her own decisions and not submit to the husband. So the things that God tells us a lot of times are counter to our own nature or they're counter to what men teach us, you know, or they're counter to what we think might be the easiest, best way, okay? And Peter is saying we're going to have to listen to God and we're going to have to live our lives his way and not our way. Um, even the foolishness of God, 1 Corinthians 1.25 says, the foolishness of God is greater than man's wisdom. That's 1 Corinthians 1.25. All right, the first thing Peter says is, if we want to live life um, and see good, love life and see good days, we must keep our tongues from evil. Um, there are two aspects of keeping the tongue from evil. And uh, before we get into that, though, there are two things in Scripture, especially in the New Testament, that God warns us over and over 
that we have to constantly guard. Our tongue. Our tongue is one and our heart is the other. Because out of the heart evil we we speak. So let's look at Proverbs four twenty three. Proverbs four twenty three. It says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Watch over your heart with all diligence. Miss Sammy, this doesn't mean we just do it one time in our lives, does it? Constant. All diligence means constantly. Constantly. And then um, look with me at Matthew 12. We're going to look at verse 34, Matthew 12, verse 34. I'm going to put a paper in there where Peter is. I don't want to lose my Peter. Matthew 12, 34. And this is Jesus speaking to the, the hypocrites of his day. He says, you brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the the heart. So whatever's in your heart, it's gonna it's gonna be found out because eventually what's gonna happen? It, you're gonna it's say gonna it. come out of your mouth. And then or do it. And then Matthew <laughs> chapter fifteen and verse eighteen, one more scripture for that. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. Okay? So we need to keep our hearts and if we keep our hearts, it's going to be easier to keep our tongues, our mouths. But those are the two things that in the New Testament we're constantly told to guard our heart and our tongue. So there are two ways that our tongue can get us into trouble. One way is by the wrong words. okay? And one way is by saying the right words maybe, but in the wrong way. okay? So we're going to look at those two aspects. So self-restraint is the first thing that's going to keep us out of trouble. Keeping the tongue in the mouth and quiet. Um, keep silent. Look at Psalm 39, verse 1. Psalm 39, verse 1. This is the Psalm of David. And he said, I said, I will guard my ways that I might not... Pardon me. I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle while the wicked are in my presence. So David says, I don't want to sin with my tongue. I'm going to guard my mouth like I have a muzzle on it. Now, I don't have a dog, but I know that you can put a muzzle on a dog's mouth and, the, and, and he can't open his mouth mouth, right? It keeps his lips together. And David said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to guard my mouth. I'm going to keep my mouth shut, in other words, in our vernacular. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I think it's in particular, he says, while the wicked are in my presence, what do we want to do when someone says something ugly to us? Retaliate in kind. Open our mouth and respond. When somebody does something to us, they cut us off in traffic or something, what do we want to do? Open that mouth, right? Or if we hurt ourselves, what are we, what are we going to do? We're going to open that mouth. And sometimes when we open that mouth, we may say something that we regret. <laughs> yeah, something besides ouch or ow. So we have to be careful, all right? We have to be careful. Um, Proverbs 10 and verse 19. Proverbs 10 and verse 19. Y'all, I try to pare down the scriptures, but there's so many good scriptures that I just like, oh, I have to include that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Proverbs 10 and 19 says, When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. So those of you who like to talk, pull it back a little bit. Because in many words, there's transgression, you know. Um, 
yeah, the more you speak, the more you're apt to say things that you ought not say. So let's just be wise. And then James tells us in James 1 and verse 19 to be quick to hear and slow to speak. And if you're speaking, can you be hearing? Most of the time, if you're talking, you can't hear what somebody else is saying, right? So James says, let's open our ears and be quick to hear, but slow to speak. So the first aspect of this is, the first aspect of keeping our tongues from evil is to guard our tongues and, and just um, show self-restraint. Show self-restraint. And a part of that is improving our word quality. For example, profanity, curses, oaths, etc. are condemned. Ephesians 4 and verse 29. We're going to look in Ephesians for a few minutes here. Ephesians 4 and verse 29. Which says... Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for what? Building up. Building up edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear it. There's that word grace, unmerited favor, to those who hear it. So we don't want to let ugly words out of our mouth. We don't want to let profanity, we don't want to let Cursing, we don't want to let swearing out of our mouths. Unkind words is the next thing. Vain words, uh, vain words, look at uh, Ephesians 5 and verse 4. There must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting. Okay? Um, so, things that are in our vernacular off color, you know, they're not quite, they're not pure, but they're not just blatant, but everybody gets the message. Um, I see this occasionally in uh, advertisements. You know, they, they can't come right out and say the ugliness that they want to say, but they'll say enough that you get the gist of it. So we need to be careful. And I think we need to be careful what we listen to, too, because what we listen to Gets embedded out. in that head, in that heart, and then it comes out in our mouths, even though we don't want it to. For example, if I watch lots of movies that have profanity, that profanity is going to get in my head eventually. And one of these days, I'm not going to think about it, and I'm going to spout something out. And it uh, is true. That will happen. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma'am. And so we need to be careful with that. Vain words, unkind words, profanity, complaining words. Was God happy with the children of Israel when they walked through the wilderness and they just, what did they do? They complained constantly. Instead of looking at their positive blessings that they had, they looked at every little hardship. Oh, man, can we be guilty of that? <laughs> yeah, we can, can't we? It's too hot outside. It's not hot enough outside. It's too dry outside. It's too wet outside. You know, I feel like this is a lesson for Catherine. <laughs> we just, we can just, we can just complain all the time. Look at First Corinthians ten and verse ten. And some people are just negative. Yeah, that's true. You never hear anything positive about that. That's right. That's right. We have certain patients that I know if I speak to them, it's going to be, it's kind of like Eeyore on Winnie the Pooh, you know? That's kind of the way it is. All right, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 10 says, Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. This is talking about the children of Israel. They grumbled and they complained. And really when you're grumbling and complaining, who is hearing it? God is, and who are you grumbling and complaining against ultimately? God. Also, Philippians 2 and verse 14. We'll look at that. Philippians 2 and verse 14, which says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing. So, if 
I am asked to fix food for a funeral, a bereaving family. I can I could fix the whole meal, but if I grumble and complain about it, is it profiting me anything? No, you might as well just It's profit it profits them, but it doesn't profit me. First Corinthians thirteen says if we don't do it out of love, if we grumble about it, then then we're wrong. We're sinful. It's causing us a problem. We're sinning. And you feel terrible about it. But so, you've already said it and done it, and there ain't nothing you can take it back. It back. That's, That's right. right. That's, That's right. right. So do our works of service. Do our kind deeds. Do do our take care of our responsibilities without grumbling. Okay. And then lying words. Colossians three and verse nine, which says. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. Did you get that? It says lying is a what kind of practice? An evil practice. An evil practice. There's a verse in Revelation, and I don't know it, but I know that the little kids would always recite it. Oh, Revelation, la, 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 whatever it is, you're lying. And, and it says liars will have their place in the lake of fire. God doesn't want us to lie. We don't want to use our, our um, mouths in lying. They say liars, liars, pants on fire. <laughs> yeah, liars, liars, pants on fire. That's right. And I never got that until just this second that yeah. they're talking about being in hell. Yeah, well, that's, that's the reason yeah. I brought that up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, that's the first part. The second part of it is the way that we say things. And we know that we can say good words, but say them in the wrong way. And that's part of the reason that texting on our phones can get us in big trouble. Because this, when I text you, it doesn't have any inflection. You don't know if that said kindly or if it's yelling. Or did you know that you can yell at somebody on a piece of paper? I have had, I hate to say this, but I've had notes at work that I felt like were yelling at me, you know? And I didn't take them very well because I felt, I felt like I was being what? Uh, you know, reprimanded. reprimanded. Yeah, yeah. So um, you can yell on a note, but it's best to go. So if we have a problem with somebody, do we need to do it through this? No, we need to go to them and speak to them. And we need to make sure that as this uh, scripture we already read, that we season our words the way we say. So seasoning is not the actual food, is it? That just makes the food more palatable. Well, that's the way with our words and the way that we speak. The, the, the way that we speak is not the actual words, but it makes those actual words palatable or it makes them bitter and angry and the other person doesn't receive them. So we have to be careful not only with the words that we speak, but with the way that we speak. And we want to do it in humility and in gentleness and in kindness, because we want to be treated the, same, the way. same way. So we should treat those people the way we want to be treated. Okay, that's where I'm going to stop today. I know this was a small uh, a lesson today, but we have some activities that we want to do. And this is a very long lesson, and I knew we couldn't get finished with everything. So this is a good stopping point. We may take two or three weeks on this lesson because it is a long lesson. It is a good lesson. It's All powerful. Right. Anybody yes. want to say anything else before we shut down our camera? No? Nope.